is Lecture 10D on epicycloids, hypocycloids, and another interesting property of the cycloid. I'm going to start with another example of a cycloid. You can recall that the prolate and the curtate cycloid were created by having the pencil at a different point other than right on the rim. So the first line here, let me get the pen, this first line right here is your curtate cycloid. Um, the pencil is located inside of the circle. Here with the lubes is your prolate cycloid, and this in the middle is a cycloid. One place that you can see the curtate cycloid is on the back of a violin. This is what I'm talking about. These curves shown in red for the back arch of a violin those curves are curtate cycloids. They're not just some arbitrary curve. Um, probably should have included this with the cycloid, but it didn't make it in the other lecture, but I wanted to show it to you. It's very interesting. For the rest of this lecture, I'm just going to give you the equations and discuss, again, some of the properties of the epicycloid and the hypocycloid. So remember, the epi and hypocycloid are drawn from one cir circle rotating over another stationary circle. For the epicycloid, the moving circle is on the outside. Epi, in Greek, is a Greek word meaning a pawn, as in epidural. And for the hypocycloid, the moving circle is inside the stationary circle, uh, again from the Greek hypo, meaning beneath, as in a hypodermic and they both have prolate and curtate versions. And then since the circle is going over and over, the moving circle is going around and around the stationary circle, the curves that are traced, the epi and hypocycloid, are also periodic curves. And they end up uh, generating a pattern depending on how, uh, how many cycles of the moving circle it takes before it starts repeating. One use of the epi and cycloid, epicycloid and hypocycloid is in the shape of gear teeth. Now different, uh, the involute of the circle is now used because it's easier to manufacture, but these epi and hypocycloids, as I understand it, are still used for handmade uh, watches and clocks. The idea is that when you have gear teeth, they must come together in exactly the right way so that the forces and the velocities are transferred uh, continuously as the gears move over each other. Otherwise there will be um, noise, wear, jerking of these gears and they won't, they won't last as long and also they'll, they'll be noisy and they won't work as well. So one solution of this is to have the gears be made in a pair, epi and hypocycloid pair. And I'm going to show you uh, an excerpt from a watch manufacturer website discussing this. So here's the discussion from a watchmaking website. So it's calling them cycloidal gears. You generate two curves. You take two th discs that we want to mesh. All right. We introduce the third rolling disc. All right. So we roll, let the rolling disc move along the outer edge of one of the gear wheels. All right. And that will generate your epicycloid. Then you take that same rolling disc and you roll it on the inside edge, and that will generate the hypocycloid. These two curves are conjugate pairs, are conjugate to each other, and those become the outer edge for those gears. Now I'm just going to present and not derive the equations for the epi and the hypocycloid. So here are the equations for the uh, epicycloid. Again, the parameter is the angle theta. For the epi and hypocycloid, you have two rolling circles, so theta is taken as a central angle of the, s of the stationary circle, not the moving circle in this case. Big R is the radius of the stationary inner circle. Little r is the radius of the outer rotating blue circle in this diagram. What determines these curves is the ratio of big R to little r. And I've rewritten this several times, trying to get that ratio isolated nicely for you, but I decided just to leave it in standard form. At any rate, it's the ratio of big R to little r that determines the shape of the curve, uh, some of which have interesting names, such as cardioid and nephroid. And here are the parametric equations for the hypocycloid. They look just like the equations for the epicycloid, except a plus sign in the epi becomes this minus sign in the hypocycloid.
Again, theta is the central angle of the stationary circle. Big R is the radius of the outer, of the stationary, not outer circle. Yeah, it is the outer circle here, sorry. And little r is the radius of the rotating inner circle in the case of the hypocycloid. Again, the ratio of big R to little r determines the shape. Here's a summary of some of the more um, of the named shapes and more interesting curves. If the ratio of the radius, of the radii of the two circles is equal, that is big R over little r equals one, the epicycloid traces out the cardioid. The hypocycloid, of course, wouldn't have much of a curve. Well, it would just chase out the, um, the it would chase out the circle because both circles would be the same size. Okay, here, big R over little r equal to two. That means the uh, stationary circle has a radius that's twice the radius of the moving circle. The hypocycloid traces out the diameter of the outer circle. That is, it will be tracing a straight line right across the outer circle. The epicycloid traces out the nephroid. The epicycloid is a nephroid, sorry. The ratio is three. The hypocycloid gives you a deltoid. And there's also a name for the epicycloid curve as well. And for four, the hypocycloid is the asteroid now these also have closed form arc link solutions, but I'm not going to work them out here. Here's some examples of hypocycloids. You can see the, the um, let me get the pencil here. Here you see when the outer circle is twice the radius of the inner circle, of the moving inner circle, then the curve that's traced out is a straight line. When the ratio is three, you see the deltoid. Here's your deltoid. Mm, then right. That's the deltoid right here. And here's the asteroid. When that ratio is four. Now when the ratio is not an integer, then it takes a couple of turns around the circle before the curve starts repeating itself. Here are more interesting curves as well. And we see the same situation for the epicycloid. First curve is a cardioid. Here's your cardioid. Here's your nephroid. In this case, the ratio of big R to little r is 1. In this case, it's 2. And here, it's not, it's not an integer and it takes many, many cycles before the pattern is established.